This paid podcast is a partnership between Slate Studios and Century 21 Real Estate. All uses of trademarks or brands are not meant to convey sponsorship or affiliation of this podcast. From Century 21 Real Estate, this is The Relentless, the podcast that looks at sales differently. As entrepreneurs, we write our own playbooks. When we're thrown off course, when assumptions hold us back, we find a way to move fearlessly in a different direction. I'm Kristen Meinzer. I'm an author, entrepreneur, and podcast host. And in a world filled with noise, there's a superpower I've developed that's helped me more than anything else. Never letting fear get in the way. That means building up confidence, taking risks, and tackling the really hard problems. And that's what we're exploring this season. How can we move fearlessly in a world filled with potential obstacles? Get ready to meet the people who transform what scares them into something that inspires them. It's time to move fearlessly and stay relentless. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Season 3 of The Relentless. We like to think of this series as an ever-expanding toolbox of fresh ideas for entrepreneurs. And the idea driving this season is a special kind of mindset— the ability to move fearlessly. Both my guests today embody that idea. They didn't wait for a system to let them in. They just did it. And what's even more extraordinary is they've each pursued paths to support their communities while simultaneously growing their businesses. Today, I'm talking with the venture capitalist Catherine Finney and Century 21 broker Vicky Montagudo. We'll meet Vicky a little later in the show. For Catherine Finney, her career path has so many twists and turns. I will not do her justice in this intro, but I will try. She is the managing partner of Genius Guild, a $20 million venture fund that invests in extraordinary Black founders. Inc. Magazine called Catherine one of the most influential women in tech. And that doesn't even begin to cover it. She started Digital Undivided, an innovative social enterprise dedicated to creating a world where women own their work. And just one month into the pandemic in April 2020, she founded the Dooney Fund to support Black women business owners. Catherine Finney's new book is called Build the Damn Thing, How to Start a Successful Business if You're Not a Rich White Guy. It's filled with concrete tips, pages for workshopping and planning, and real-life anecdotes from her own entrepreneurial life. Truly so much wisdom, and also a really fun read. Catherine Finney, welcome to The Relentless. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to chat with you today. Let's go back to your early days as an entrepreneur and the fears you faced making some major leaps, starting with Budget Fashionista, which, full disclosure, a huge fan of. It's a lifestyle blog that was founded back in the early 2000s. And yes, in the early 2000s, I was one of those people logging on in the early days. Mm -hmm. Was there a voice in your head 20 years ago saying those words you're now known for, build the damn thing? Uh, How did you go about starting this whole thing? You know, I there wasn't, because at that time, if we can remember back to the Stone Ages, um, it was right after the first tech bust. So I started this thing called a blog. No one knew what it was. I remember telling my mother, and she's like, a log, a blog, a snog. Like, what is that? Um, And (laughs) I just started documenting my shopping as if I was like, you know, a a reporter um, reporting on shopping finds. And I've always been very good at fashion. Um, It's a passion of mine my entire life. And so it was just sort of this extension. And fast forward a few years, this blog was a huge success. It was turning a healthy profit. For a while, you were even a Today Show regular offering your budget fashion tips nationally to millions of people. Yeah, it was like a lot of fun. Um, But I knew that I wanted to do something else. I knew that I didn't want to make that transition that was happening, and I saw things were changing. And so I started on the path to decouple myself from the budget fashionista and make it be a standalone media company um, that could be sold. And I had an option to either sell it, uh, take private equity and scale it, or take venture capital and scale it. And I decided that I didn't want to take private equity or venture capital because when you take private equity and venture capital, you have to stay for a period. Mm. And I was going to have to stay for three to four years, and I was really ready to move on. So I sold it. And I remember 
when the wire cleared into my bank account. And I was so scared. I don't know if I thought they were going to take the money back or whatever, but, (laughs) you know, there was a lot of zeros there, more zeros than I had ever seen in my entire life. And I remember going to the bank and I, you know, had sat on the money for a while, like for maybe a week or two because I was paralyzed. And my mother said, you need to go do something for yourself. You go do something you've always wanted to do. So um, I took a trip to the South Pacific, to New, New Zealand, to Australia, to Fiji, to Cook Islands, like all of those sort of things. Like I've always wanted to go. I'm going to go. And so I went into the bank and it was a teller who was African American too. And you know, I said, I'm going to take out, I don't know, 200, 300, whatever amount of money you take before you go on vacation. And he looked at my bank account and he said, Oh, girl, you are doing good for yourself. This is you. <laughs> you are doing good for yourself. I am so proud of you. And you know, I think most people would find it kind of, you know, odd if a teller said that <laughs> to you. But you could see that he was so proud. And I often think. Um, maybe he went home that night and he talked to his family and said, you know what? I met another African-American, this young African-American woman who had all this money in the bank. And she told me she had sold her company. And I just want to share with you that that's possible, right? And I just thought of like the possibilities that maybe came through because that teller saw me and, and that I had money in the bank and was so proud and shared it with his family. And like, it's moments like that that makes everything that I do so worth it, Mm -hmm. um, Because I know that what I'm doing is hopefully um, giving a light to others and a path to others, including in the book, um, which is why I'm so honest in the book. Um, Some people may say a little too honest (laughs) about some of the challenges. But I want people to know that even those people who have a level of success, we all have to go through some stuff. Yeah, and I really appreciate how you don't shy away from those tough moments in your book, like the time when you were in a room full of startup founders, mostly white men, and you pitched this idea for a tech-driven beauty company for Black women. Can you tell our listeners about that? One person said to me, he didn't think I could relate to other Black women because I had an accountant. What does that even mean, by the way? What does that even mean? You know, I I. At that point, I didn't know how to respond. Um, And I think when you are an other, when you're a builder, when you're not a rich white guy and you're put on the spot, um, you often have to like go through these mental calculations in your head really quickly to figure out how you're going to respond to someone's stupidity. And you go into these spaces and other can be not just a person of color, a woman, maybe you come from an immigrant family, maybe you come from a family that didn't come from money. And you go into these spaces, know that most of them don't really know anything. And that, you know, always ask yourself, what is the perspective of this person who's giving me this information and advice? Do they actually really know what they're talking about? Yeah, and what I love is you turned this enraging moment into an inspiring one. And your book really prepares readers for uncomfortable pivots, like the question you urge entrepreneurs to ask themselves. Is your product solving a problem or providing for a need that people have? Yeah, you know, if if no one's buying your product, it's a hobby. (laughs) <laughs> um, and 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 I think a lot of us get really enamored with our hobbies. Now, hobbies can turn into businesses. Hopefully, um, you can turn something that you really enjoy doing into something that makes you money. But if someone's not buying it, it's a hobby. And so that's one of the things that people often get confused on or they create a product and they try to find a market for it. So in the book, I talk about doing the ugly baby test, which, you know, <laughs> everyone feels their baby is beautiful and all babies really are beautiful. But but your company baby may not be that that beautiful. <laughs> it may not be cute. Like, <laughs> But, you know, it's so hard for us to hear that, right? That maybe your idea isn't so great, you know? Mm. we like <laughs> It's really hard because you've dedicated all your time and you so believe in it and you so... But maybe it's not great. So how do you find that out before you tap into your 401k, which, you, which I highly advise against? <laughs> your background is actually scientific. You trained as an epidemiologist at Yale. Uh, how does that relate to all of this? How did you go from that to this? And does that epidemiology background somehow help you as an entrepreneur? 
Yeah, you know, I was always the most fashionable person in lab. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, at, at, at Yale, it was like uh, a discussion in the medical school about like my fashion because I always had like great style. <laughs> um, you know, I use a lot of that degree in what I do because when you're an epidemiologist, and I think a lot of us have actually learned what epidemiology is over the past couple of years, um, you look at trends, you look at patterns, and you particularly look at patterns as it relates to populations of people. Mm. And so it's been really helpful for me in identifying patterns and forecasting sort of what's next because I've been trained to forecast what's next. And I've been trained to look at data and curves and help predict where something is going to go. And all of that sort of training I've put um, into great use into what I do now, particularly in terms of investing. You've talked about the fact that you had people in your family and even, you know, a teller at a bank cheering you on as a Black person. Uh, And uh, that you were trying to start a business to serve the Black beauty market and so on. You've really embraced this as part of your business journey. What advice do you have for other people out there who, you know, want to work in social enterprises, who want to move through the business world uh, with that front and center for them? You know, I chose... uh you know, really focusing on Black communities because that's what I know. Mm -hmm. Um, And whenever I talk to a group of women or other people of color, I always say start with what you know. Um, Start with the community that you know. If you're a mom, there are so many needs that we have as mom. I am a mom to a six-year-old. I can list a bunch of startup ideas that I need someone to work on to help me. (laughs) And I know millions of other moms are too, particularly in the child care caregiving space. Um, And I happen to know the Black community. I've been Black my entire life. So (laughs) I have a front row seat. And so, and I also knew, um, because of my training as an epidemiologist and the ability to spot trends, that this is a community that's been grossly underserved, a market that has so much opportunity. And so it makes sense to focus uh, from a business perspective because this is a rich community from which ideas can come. And and where the social part of it comes in for me is this concept of we all can win. And I truly believe that. I truly, truly believe that we can create a world where everybody wins. Catherine, a lot of our listeners are in the real estate space, which is an industry that requires a deep entrepreneurial spirit and a very tough skin when it comes to failure and rejection because the reality is a lot of new agents join the real estate business and things don't go the way they want them to right away. Um, When you have faced rejection and failure after a long slog, how have you recovered? You know, the key is to know that failure is not the end point. It's a data point. Mm. Um, And what can you gather from that moment? What type of data can you gather? And how can you use that data to then get to the end point, which is success? I'm so curious because nowadays we have all these tools for building those relationships. We have, you know... TikTok, Instagram, we have a million social media, you know, um, channels that we can go to, things that didn't exist when you were starting out. What tools did you use back in the day to, you know, build that customer base before all these things existed? And what do you use now? It was really in-person interactions. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It was networking. It was going to events. It was handing out business cards, which I know sounds so antiquated because, like, no one hands out business cards anymore. (laughs) But but it was really in-person events. I still think meeting people in person is still the best way um, because we're human beings and we can feed off of each other's energy, and that is so important. And particularly when you're in an industry which is a very people-heavy industry, like, for example, real estate, where you're going to be spending a lot of time with your clients over the course of of the either selling or buying a a place, having that in-person relationship is super, super important. Something else I just, you know, this is something that I'm taking away from you is one way you meet people is by having the reputation for being a helper and an uplifter. Mm -hmm. And 
that makes people want to be around you. Like, oh, here's somebody who, you know, is a helper, uh, not a salesperson, even though you are a salesperson, obviously. Yeah. You know, it's part of the entrepreneurship that you do. But you are somebody who is of service. You do that in not just your entrepreneurial work, in your philanthropic work, in your venture capital work, your reputation. And I guess that goes back to your core values, right? I think, you know, my core value, the number one sort of core value of Genius Guild and of me personally is be human, Mm -hmm. which means uh, see the humanity in others, but also see the humanity in myself. I think, you know, being of service to someone, particularly without any expectations, has been one of the greatest joys of my life because sometimes you don't know when it's going to be returned to you. And so sometimes being in service is just simply recognizing other human beings and recognizing your humanity and appreciating it. But sometimes it's also something bigger. Today in 2022 as a venture capitalist, this outlook really influences how you choose the businesses you invest in. Can you tell us about some of those businesses, some of the ones you're really excited about? The companies I invest in are primarily come from where I have knowledge and where I have experience. And so um, we invest in companies that are rethinking the supply chain, particularly as it comes to minority suppliers, companies that are working to produce virtual events using blockchain, companies that are um, working communities that are traditionally marginalized. And one of our companies, which, you know, is truly a full circle moment for me, It is a company that is kind of like WebMD for Black women that is led by a Black woman epidemiologist. So talk about a full circle moment that I'm actually investing in myself. (laughs) Um, And to be able to do that, especially when for so long venture capitalists have done that, they've invested in themselves, people who are like them, which has meant that they've excluded a whole bunch of other people. And now I'm in the position to be able to do the same. Um, It's pretty, pretty amazing. Beautiful. Full circle. I love it. And along the same lines, you saw a different need at the beginning of the pandemic. So you created something called the Dooney Fund. What is that? During the pandemic, we saw the problems that were happening to Black women entrepreneurs in our own um, programs. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to give it to other Black women entrepreneurs. I'm seeing the impact of what happened when I did that for our portfolio companies. And so it started off as we're going to give $100 to just 100 and within six weeks, it went from, you know, $100 to $100 to $100 to over 1,500 Black women entrepreneurs. It was and continues to be one of the greatest things I think I've ever done in my life um, and fundamentally changed my life and the way I thought about capital. Now, this season of The Relentless is all about how to move fearlessly. How did you practice having a fearless mindset in the early days when you were starting out? And how is moving fearlessly different for you today? My fearless mindset comes really from my parents. Um, My parents gave me two gifts that uh, very few young Black people, young people, period, receive. One was I saw my parents take a risk and win. I saw my parents, my father, who was a um, black man, he was a brewery worker, didn't graduate from high school until he was in his 30s and graduated valedictorian, found his way into a workforce development course, um, learning C++ in 1982, and from there became an executive at Microsoft and really rose through the ranks. And I saw my parents pick up and leave everything they knew in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and move to Minneapolis, where we knew absolutely no one. Um, And that move changed the trajectory of my family's life. And it was a huge risk. And it paid off. And it paid off big. And so being a young person and seeing that, and particularly a young Black person seeing someone take a risk and win, had a big impact. Catherine Finney, your story and your book really got me thinking. It is a true gift to entrepreneurs and anyone else building a business I'm so grateful for your time. Thank you for joining us on The Relentless. Thank you for having me. It's been so fun talking with you. Catherine Finney isn't only focused on her own entrepreneurial success. She walks the walk and invests in the communities she deeply cares about. 
My next guest puts her own stamp on this community-minded approach as she builds her real estate business. Vicky Montagudo is the owner and designated broker of Century 21 Tri-Cities in Washington State. For Vicky, she's finding innovative ways to support the over 70 agents that affiliate with her company. And her wider community is as much a part of her brokerage as connecting customers to their dream homes. Vicki, welcome to The Relentless. Thank you for having me today. Now, first and foremost, what inspired you to be a real estate agent? Funny that you say that. So I come from a very entrepreneurial lineage of family members. We have owned everything from uh, farms to taverns to funeral homes. And wow. so is really, I would say, more or less bred into me at a really early age, um, the dynamics of entrepreneurship. And so I knew at the age of uh, 10 years old that I would open my own business. And it wouldn't be until I got into college and took a business law class and then was introduced to a professor that was then teaching a real estate course that I then later took to then develop this passion and the contractual know-how of real estate to then essentially fall in love with the industry. Wow. I love that you had this idea at 10. I am going to own my own business. Most 10-year-olds are thinking, maybe someday if I'm brave enough, I'll have a lemonade stand. But (laughs) but you're thinking bigger. You are thinking much bigger. But I got to ask, as you became a broker and an owner of your own business, was there a moment when maybe you realized a bigger system maybe didn't want to let you in, that they weren't as welcoming as they could be, um, and that you had to make it happen for yourself despite that fact? You know, as a true entrepreneur, I always say you have that fire in your belly and that sometimes as an entrepreneur, the things that are the most obvious to everyone else you, you t- end up turning a blind eye to. And so in my beginning years, and this will be my 20th year in real estate, when I first began my career, um, I, I started specializing in new construction. And in those first 10 years, what I grew to learn and understand was a lot of my clientele was builders and developers, which are predominantly male in our, in our area. And so what I learned really quickly when they would fly in on their Lear jets and we would uh, go through product planning or land acquisitions was that, you know what? At the end of the day, everybody puts their pants on the same way. And when I came to realize that what barriers came down was outside of gender, outside of the social economics, um, of the diversity of the clients that I was working with was that at the end of the day, everybody is everybody. But in the beginning, I, you know, there wasn't that many female broker owners, sole broker owners, right? Maybe husband and wife, but not 100% female owned. Again, I don't use those as excuses or distractions. I actually think of that as a marketing opportunity. Mm. It, it's easier to stand out in a room when you're one of few. Right. And mm-hmm. so uh, with that opportunity, uh, I proved to myself that I was able to rebuild the company. Uh, this is our 10th year with Century 21. I started with one other agent with Century 21 and now have grown it to over 72 agents. Um, and our geographic tor- territory here in Washington State is very far reaching. And I've brought that new construction experience with working with developers and builders as a platform for my agents to represent their sales teams. But just to give credit where credit is due here, you're saying, you know, being the only woman in the room sometimes made you stand out, but you've been shattering the glass ceiling and making sure that it's not just you in the room anymore. With the teams that you've built, you've made sure that you're, you know, pulling other people up the ladder with you. I have I have to just give you credit for that. Oh, thank you very much. That means a lot because, you know, sometimes as as task-oriented as I am, you're so busy on the next that you forget to almost celebrate the the wins that you've already created. Yeah. And one thing I always say is, what is the point of shattering the glass ceiling if I can't bring other people through the glass with me? And Mm -hmm. yeah, you're doing that. You are. (laughs) Thank you. Now, you and your brokerage 
Century 21 Tri-Cities partner with all kinds of businesses and organizations in the community, from restaurants and wineries to local credit unions, Tri-Cities Cancer Center, the Humane Society. I I could go on and on. Is there one partnership that's especially close to your heart? There is. Um, So I I graduated from Pasco High, which is a local high school here in the Tri-Cities. I've lived here all my life. When I was a senior at Pasco High, it was the first year that they had put on what they call a Bulldog um, Homes program. And it was a really unique program here in Washington State where it gave an opportunity for the students to take the conceptual plans of building a home, working on the foundation, working through framing, setting trusses, going through the electrical stage, working with plumbers, And going all the way to the end and taking between August and May to complete the home and then to be able to open market the home, I thought that was such a a unique opportunity to connect all the things that we learn in high school and connect it to real life opportunities. So there's actually three high schools that work on the home every given year. And so my role that I play on the executive committee, it's my job to source the piece of land that we're going to build on within that community. It's also my position to then try to acquire the land at a price that provides scholarships back to the students. And the less that we we pay for the land, the more we can give back in scholarships. And so we're in that process right now. We've cited another uh, home site for our students to build. And they're going to take that project from August to May, and then we'll open market it to all the relatable um, realtors here located in our marketplace, which is about 1,200. And they'll all have equal opportunity to sell the property. Um, the other contribution that Century 21 provides is I source the land, but we also represent the committee and the students, and we don't take a commission on the listing side. Um, but again, it's 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 really neat to provide a, a different window of opportunity for these students to look at, okay, there there's these other industries that you can get into, but you know, really having on the job training um, in the trades, and which we all know is very, very, very underserved in all markets. Oh, yeah. Um, we have such a shortage of tradespeople right now. and This is teaching them something valuable. The fact that there are scholarships available, the fact that this is improving a community and giving back to people. There are just so many ripples of what this kind of community work is doing. It's not just one thing. And a lot of entrepreneurs, they resist that kind of involvement. Uh, They're focused on growing their business. They aren't really thinking about, like, how do I work with the community in the way that you do? If you were to advise one of those people who's skeptical about, you know, doing what you do, what would you say to convince them otherwise? Or what would you tell them as far as how to start? I think sometimes as brokers, we kind of get disconnected from the front lines. And when I say that is we spend endless amount of times coaching our agents on what they need to do with their business. And oftentimes as brokers, we we tend not to self-reflect on some of those practices that we're preaching to our agents as to what we need to do as brokerage owners. And fundamentally, what we talk to our agents about very often is don't be that transactional agent. Be a relationship builder. And what I've found with our brokerage and the success that we've had over the course of the last 10 years is when you give back, inherently you get more back in return. And not that that's the purpose, but when you actually weave yourself into a community, it it doesn't go unnoticed. Yeah. And it makes the community that you are selling and selling to a more desirable place. And also, just speaking from personal experience with my own work with communities, it just makes my work more fun. It just makes me happier. And um, isn't that what we all want is for our work to be fun and to feel something special with what we're doing? Yeah. When you you take that approach to life where you pay forward, you know, just great things happen and great opportunities present themselves. I'm curious, your personal identity and your background, how have they helped you to connect with clients and that greater community we're talking about? So I'm half Caucasian and half Filipino. And so 
my father uh, had immigrated from the Philippines here to the United States. And it was really interesting to, to grow up watching both my parents and also listening in their different perspectives. But I think that's the flavor of what I bring to my industry is the work ethic that my mother had taught us. And so pairing that with my father's love of people, always smiling, always willing to take that moment to listen and take those moments to understand people's perspective and where they come from, I think it really actually has has been kind of the best marriage of their different personality types. Our guest earlier in the episode has a phrase that sums up her approach to entrepreneurship. It is build the damn thing, meaning <laughs> don't wait around for someone to give you permission to start your business. <laughs> Do you have a phrase that captures your own entrepreneurial spirit? Oh, gosh. You know, again, going to back to my father coming from the Philippines, I think as Americans, what we tend to lose sight of is the reason why so many people come to the United States because it still is today the land of opportunity and the opportunity to do and be who you want to be and also grow the type of companies that you want to grow. And listening in to the, the things that he, you know, had to go through, and it was beyond, you know, walking uphill nine miles each way to school <laughs> in the snow, right? <laughs> but it's knowing that, you know, you're, you are the only thing that stands in your way. Mm. And if you can overcome your self-objections, anything is possible. And so the one thing that I always think of is it's not the size of the load. It's how you decide to carry it. Yeah, don't lift with your back. Use your legs. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Vicki, this has been such a delight. Thank you for joining us on The Relentless today. Thank you so much for having me today. The Relentless is produced by Slate Studios in partnership with Century 21 Real Estate. You can find out more about the guests you heard in today's show and discover more great material from our Century 21 partners at slate.com slash C21 Relentless. I'm Kristen Meinzer. Thank you so much for listening. And please join us next time on The Relentless. All rights reserved. Nothing herein is intended to create an employment relationship. Century 21 Real Estate, LLC, fully supports the principles of the Fair Housing Act and the Equal Opportunity Act. Each office is independently owned and operated. This material may contain suggestions and best practices that you may use at your discretion.